Hi everyone, welcome to this week's Cyber Risk Engineering. We have with us again, Free from Lunasec, who's going to talk to us a little bit about Spring for Shell. Free, welcome back. Long time no uh, see. Thank, thanks, Yanis. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. Uh, it's still still pretty early here. I'm still booting up my brain, so I apologize, everyone, if I'm a little slow. It's been a crazy past couple of days. I think for everyone in the whole infosec space, I think it's going to continue to be a crazy couple of days too. I think the whole weekend is shot for a lot of people working at companies affected by this. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so what's going on? Lunasec strikes again, free, right? We had log for shell three months ago. And now spring for shell and is struts for shell next <laughs> or... struts for shell. I don't know. I, this time I didn't name it, honestly. Um, I think people were just, you know, it's a job of vulnerability. Spring is about as popular as log for J. So people right. just kind of like, you know, RCE Java, boom, like there's no four, there's no four in spring. I think people are calling it like spring shell and then people just start calling it spring for shell. And then people throw it drew a shitty MS Paint logo. Um, <laughs> I've so much seen that. That was funny. <laughs> I love the trademark on that logo, by the way. Yeah, it makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So just for our audience, a similar format to what we've done in the past. So we're going to run this for about 45 minutes, leave 15 minutes for Q&A to, towards the end. Uh, normal channels. Uh, to provide your questions, email, social media. There's a, a live chat channel here on, on YouTube for this event. Um, so do drop in uh, any questions that, that you might have. Purpose of today's YouTube live event is really to demystify Spring for Shell or Spring Shell. Uh, the recent set of vulnerabilities uh, will go through what those vulnerabilities are. We'll go a little bit through exploit paths where we have remote code executions where we don't. This is a technical presentation, right? So you don't need to be Java experts, but at the same time, if we say Java serialization, uh, we hope that you know what that means. So we're not going to explain those, those concepts. Uh, so with that housekeeping in mind, uh, Free, tell us a little bit about the timeline of events this time around. <laughs> when, when does this journey on Spring for Shell start? Uh, to be honest, right before I was going to go to bed, <laughs> I think I'm like, it's technically Wednesday, but it's like the end of Tuesday. And I was just on Hacker News looking, and there's this post with like three or four upvotes that was towards the bottom of the front page. And I was like, huh, that looks interesting. It was like, I forget what it even was. It might have been like a link to Twitter or something, but you know, it was, it seemed interesting. Clicked on it, started looking into this. And then it was 4 a.m. And then I, I was tweeting about it a little bit. By the time I went to sleep and woke up, people were talking about it more. And it was clear that this was something that was probably going to become a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this was March 29th, I assume. Or, well, let's have a look. Oh, no. So Tuesday yeah. to Wednesday, 29th to the 30th. I recall that day we had um, a couple of tweets um, that then got re deleted, screenshotted, reposted. Uh, threat intelligence team went wild uh, about making sure that those tweets were uh, tweets, sorry, were captured and actually uh, posted back for for information. And it was supposedly demonstrating a POC zero day exploit involving the Java library uh, Spring and specific yeah, the, yeah, the if, core component. I for, I forget exactly what the original tweet was. There. I feel like the original tweet was somebody just being like, hey, here's a CVE, like here's, I'm popping, I'm popping a shell on somebody's, on this like proof of concept uh, code that I wrote. Like, I think it was just like a screen, screenshot of curl or something along those lines showing like calculator popping up. Yeah, um, I think it was like on a local host and it had um, either web scanner, zap or burp. Uh, burp suite, yeah, it, uh, with a, something... just a request response, something really basic exactly. uh, like that. So good. So we've, we've read the same news. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, hopefully something like that. <laughs> most but of then that's, that's all people were going off of. So it was kind of this like witch hunt. And I think a post cyber Kendra was the website posted about this. And that's, nice. I think cyber Kendra was the link that I, I clicked on hacker news actually. And they kind of were translating from like, I think Chinese to English. And it wasn't like, um, there weren't very many details there. People were speculating that this was a, 
a DC, which is like a common problem in Java, where if you can, you know, control uh, in, input into a deserialization function, you can get code execution that way. Um, and there was a commit in the Spring repo saying like we're deprecating this this uh, deserialization function, but that was total red herring. Um, that was not actually the problem that ended up correct. Really. But part part of what was making it so confusing for people was that there was a CVE that was confirmed by the Spring team in the Spring Cloud function uh, library yes. the same day. Which at, in the end, CV 2022-22965, can't believe I've memorized that uh, already, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is, is the vulnerability that was being discussed. Hold on, let me just check I've got it right because there's been so many CVs. Uh, yeah, so that's the VM where uh, Spring Framework RC data binding on on JDK nine, right? So so that's the the actual CV. So uh, we're now in Wednesday, and we have a couple of uh, different remote code execution scenarios unfolding. Um, at this time, you guys at Lunasec published was it Wednesday or Thursday that you you published the the relevant blog post? I did a blog post on Wednesday. I want to say around 11 a.m. Pacific, um, mm -hmm. and all all we were saying. I spent a couple of hours that morning when I woke up writing it, but it was basically just trying to untangle the two conversations that people were having. Like people were talking about, oh, there is a POC for this exploit, but then a lot of people were linking to the Spring Cloud Function POCs without realizing they were talking about two Correct. different things. Correct, and they were separate things, right? So hopefully, uh, for our audience today, we're going to take all these events that we're listing out in a timeline and just go through them one by one and help you just demystify a little bit uh, what's happening. And then we'll also give some preconditions with uh, regards to uh, what it means to be, uh, to have uh, an exploitable uh, instance here. Okay, so. I've apparently lost my video. Can you still hear me? We can hear you. We can't see you. Okay. No, well, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Hold on a sec. Just keep talking. I'll, okay. I'll my mic. Fair enough. Fair enough. With any live event, you get these uh, small glitches. So if we look at actually the latest information, so I just want to give everyone an update there. And we also have our, our first question on chat. Uh, we'll make sure we cover that question. So we're now at the stage where for the specific Spring for Shell vulnerability, uh, Spring has released two libraries, 5.3.18 and 5.2.20, uh, that address the relevant issue in question. Also, just for any of those uh, of you who are panicking out there, uh, there's no need to panic. This is a very specific vulnerability. Uh, you need to be on Java 9 as one precondition, and we'll go through um, other uh, preconditions as well. And also the exploitation involves having some control uh, over bypassing the spring protect protections on that um, on the set of properties that the class loader has. And we'll, we'll cover all this just a little bit more, more detail. So that's just a, a high level overview of good news that we have regarding Spring for Shell, right? Um, now, three, welcome back. Uh, we always get just small technical glitches when, when there's a, a, a live event. So could you please walk us through actually what is the remote code execution with regards to uh, Spring for Shell. Uh, yeah, but I guess my camera's not gonna not gonna work. It might be the USB hub I have, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what like what you're saying, Ines, uh, there are there are a lot of mitigating factors around this that make it less severe than Log for Shell was. Um, that said, we don't necessarily know all of the exploitation scenarios. It, as it currently is, we know of one set of, we know of one scenario that exists, um, which I guess, how, how to say, uh, this is more or less a bypass for a CVE that's 12 years old. There's a CVE that came out in 2010 that was also in Spring, that was basically this exact vulnerability and Spring produced a patch for it. And, and patch it. What what changed is in Java nine when they added Java modules, 
yes. that was not ever addressed in the spring code base. So this like context injection, I don't really, I guess it's called like class loader manipulation. Um, there are a couple of names that this, this kind of attack goes by, but basically in, in spring, you can set query parameters in your request that get pushed up to, to, to spring. So in your HTTP request, you're setting parameters. And when you have like nested objects, in Java, mm -hmm. if you want to be able to pass properties into those, you can use this syntax that Spring provides with like periods to set variables. I call it like a plain old Java object or POJO, which is basically just a normal Java object. And so you can set any of the variables on this Java object from your HTTP request. It's just designed to make it really easy to like validate your request and have Spring do more of the work for you. Uh, the problem is, some of the properties on this object are very sensitive and Spring has prevented some of them from being set remotely. But in the case of Java modules, you can set variables that allow you to talk to the class loader, which in Java, if you can talk to the class loader, you can effectively turn it into um, a remote code execution. Correct. There are there are more steps to it than that. You have to actually have to get Tomcat to like, write something out to the disk, it's just a JSP file, then the JSP file has to get loaded in, which is JSP is kind of like PHP for Java. So there's a number of preconditions. I, I think it's really important that we cover the what, right? And then just be able to have a common language here. So you need to be on Java 9 in order for this vulnerability to be exploitable. In Java 9, there is a new feature. Uh, it's a new API. It's Java class- Java newer. Or newer, thank you. Yes, very true. So you need to be with Java 9 or newer. In Java 9 or newer, there is a new feature, class.getModule. And this allows for the libraries of Spring up to the ones that are being released now to be able to load properties which are manipulated as parameters from a user request. So think of a set of parameters in the same way that we have a get or a post request, everyone. And these are coming in through the wire. They're user controlled parameters, right? These parameters are now going to impact. It's not some sort of uh, cross-site scripting or you know, SQL or some other XML type of injection, but they're going to impact the class loader of Java with specific configuration properties, which really shouldn't be in the control of the user. What that ends up doing is giving you the ability, now we're a little bit in lock for shell territory, effectively you're creating, be it a JSP or another, you know, it might be, um, it might be enterprise Java beans, it might be, uh, I don't know, any other sort of, uh, of the enterprise Java world, but you're creating something that is then making calls or can be called upon by the malicious attacker. And then at that stage, it's basically game over because you have control of something on the server, which is able to make calls and that has and is be running on the properties that the class loader of Java has, right? So a little bit of a long-winded explanation here yeah. as to what this vulnerability entails, but the basic reconditions involve Java 9 using a set of Spring libraries, which now there are patches for, and we'll, we'll cover that as well. I just want to make sure that everyone in our audience um, understands what this vulnerability is about in just layman's terms. Um, so with that in mind, we've covered a little bit the timeline and we've, we've covered what the vulnerability is. Now, you mentioned, Free, that there are a number of other vulnerabilities as well. And some of these are non-exploitable. They don't involve remote code execution. Plus, there was another vulnerability that was being um, referenced, uh, which ended up to having little uh, to nothing to do with the current remote code execution. So can you just please clarify what has, which exploit involves RCE, remote code ex execution, and what are the other vulnerabilities in question, which yes, might be important, but don't involve remote code execution? Um, I, don't, I don't know if there, there are any that don't involve remote code execution. Um, in, the, in the blog post that we wrote, I, put, I listed three things. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is like, I want to just say it's like unconfirmed 
probably is not exploitable. I think enough people have tried banging on it. Um, that was the like deserialization one that was referencing the commit in the spring repo. Um, probably not exploitable. Maybe maybe there's a pat a pattern there. I don't know. But the one that is exploitable but has a much smaller use case is the cloud a spring cloud function is what it is. I, I believe it's like a serverless execution plugin. That one, I don't remember the whole CV. It's CV 22 something something, 63963. Um, <laughs> 963, that's six, the one. Yeah, so 6.3, that's the one. But the scope of that is much less because Spring Cloud Function is like, it's not very popular in, in comparison to like Spring Core. Spring Core, um, yeah, absolutely. Which, you know, Spring Core is everything. So then there's 965, which is the Spring Core RCE. And that is the one that we were just describing. Correct. I, I'm, there may be other things out there, but I'm, I'm not aware of them. I, I went right. to sleep and I woke up again. So everything's probably changed. So at the risk of us uh, missing a new vulnerability or something that has happened uh, that two different companies around the world have not, Baron and Lunasec, have not uh, caught up to, uh, we think we have the latest information. So just to name CVEs and vulnerabilities here, this is very important so that we know what we're talking about. Spring for Shell, remote code ex execution, uh, involves Spring Core, and it involves specific versions. And this is CVE 2022-22965. Just remember 965, right? Um, that's the most severe vulnerability. The second vulnerability, which also is confirmed, is CVE 2022-22963, so it ends in 963. It involves the Spring Cloud function, is also a remote code execution vulnerability, but has a much lesser scope. Why? Because uh, Spring Cloud is a function, while Spring Core is the core component of the, the Spring framework. Then there is a third weakness, which is unconfirmed, and there could be more here, but currently we don't have any confirmed cases of remote code execution on this. There isn't a CVE to go with it, and this is within Spring Core and focuses on the infamous process of deserialization. I say infamous because there's been so many attacks over the years on Java objects which are being serialized and, and deserialized. Now for this third case, we don't have to date any confirmation that this is exploitable with remote code execution. There might be other exploits. You might be able to load a, a class that is too big, um, cause the JVM a little bit to, to have to think and work extra hard, but actually uh, there isn't a specific issue with that vulnerability. Okay, and as Free's video is starting to play up again, I just wanna make sure that we cover those three uh, vulnerabilities that I know what I'm getting you for Christmas free, which is just a, a brand new camera. Um, I'll have a USB hub. That's the right. Problem. Okay. Okay. So that should be clear, right? We have Spring for Shell. It has a CV, remote code execution. We have another type of remote code execution involves Spring Cloud. Um, now let's talk a little bit about how you've come about to know. Uh, the seriousness behind this vulnerability. I mean, okay, it was on Twitter, but you mentioned before that, you know, you were tired, it was end of day, you saw this in the news and somehow it caught your attention. So what did you find interesting with this specific um, vulnerability, uh, which at the time was just, you know, it was just chatter on different social media and so on and so forth. What what kind of inspired you there to go and say, oh, okay, I need to stay up and look at this and analyze it further? Um, I don't know. I want to say like my spidey sense or something like that. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's, I mean, it beats a couple of prerequisites uh, for, for like potential of interest. It's like, you know, I know what I know what Spring is, even though I'm not like a crazy Java developer. Like I know it's like super popular. So an RCE in it is bad, just like Log4J. Like I'm not an expert of Log4J. I've used it for a couple of like random projects, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it I I know the name. And if there's an RCE in it, I know it's gonna be really bad because you know GR is gonna be affected. All these like huge products used by tons and tons of companies are gonna be affected. And, you know, Fortune 500 companies have a lot of this this tech, and so if there's a vulnerability in it. 
and Fortune 500 companies using it, there's gonna be a lot of money involved for, for Black Hats and they're gonna wanna start looking at it. So, you know, that, that I think was uh, a big part of it. Also, 1 a.m. for me is the middle of the day for a lot of people. Uh, so things are probably gonna move fast, just posting something up about it, trying to start getting information about it is enough to kind of be able to wake up and have, have enough information to start figuring out if this is, if this is real or not, start getting more people looking at it just to verify or, you know, dismiss if there's a problem. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, you guys at Lunasec actually put together, um, just a brief POC type of uh, exploit that involves Pojo. Uh, do you want to walk us through that? What exactly is that exploitation that you've blogged about? Yeah. Um, so there was an exploit that had leaked. And so like that was a POC exploit. And nobody's really sure where it came from. Um, that, yeah, I guess how to... The exploit that we ended up posting about, the exploit that everybody is, and everybody ended up using to confirm that this vulnerability existed, um, was it was all in Chinese. There's a PDF file of how to set up a Spring app to set up like a minimum vulnerable case for it, uh, but it didn't actually work. Interestingly enough, like mm. we, it didn't work. Um, I think for a lot of people, like you couldn't just like paste this thing together. It wasn't like you know, here, here's clone this repo, run this command. Cool, you proved exploitability. Um, <laughs> it was, it, it, it was more of like a smell test, I think, for security researchers going out there who could kind of like see where this was going and then connect the rest of the dots. Right, um, right. Which is common, yeah. actually, in terms of giving the exploit but not weaponize it, right, and actually give it in some sort of semi-broken broken state so if yeah. i had a um if i had a um an instance of um you know um, let's say the vm that you guys set up or the docker right that you've set up with this vulnerable instance uh, what what would i be looking to do in order to be able to know and confirm that this is not a patched version of spring how i, I... Can you rephrase that question? Are you asking like how can you confirm if something is patched? Yes. Or it's a test if it's vulnerable? Correct. Uh, so there's a specific command that I've seen people using um, that if you paste it in, it tries to, I forget the exact command, but it, it basically is trying to use the, the POJO ejection. Um, and if it is vulnerable, it will return a status code 400 to you. Um, otherwise, in theory, it should just work. That's that's what I've seen for people testing it. But this is I have a bunch of emails and and threads on Twitter uh, with white hat people trying to figure this exact problem out of people trying to figure out like what is a good way to test if a server is vulnerable. It's also not going to give a ton of false positives. I don't think anybody has like a crazy answer to that right now, just because of how recent this is. Yes, correct. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say there's no silver bullet yet. What I've seen just to add to that free i've seen a um a passing of a class loader property which then actually sets a specific pattern to be true or false and then that gives you the ability to then verify that something has changed in the environment through a separate request um, so even though that sounds like a simple w get or curl or whatever request uh, you want to send, it's much more complex than that because then you've got to verify whether or not the parameter that you're trying to set is true or false or has the an, another value, basically. So you're, you're, that, you're modifying like the global state and then checking in a separate request to see if it was modified? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so that's one, right? And the second involves exactly what you said. So basically just seeing something around resources or context or something whereby is attempting to be verified that it's altered, right? And then checking that. And then just for, um, to, to make sure that, I think this is really important for our audience that there isn't a simple check that you could do on the spring version of a specific request and then say, ah, oh, okay, it's below this number, therefore 
it's vulnerable. In order for that to be available, Spring needs to be misconfigured. The vulnerable version of Spring needs to be misconfigured to allow for the naming of the version that it's currently running in Spring Core. That involves debug information, the test environment, that development server that's exposed to the internet, something like that. So you, do, you wouldn't you wouldn't be seeing that type of information in um, your standard uh, configuration of, uh, of Spring MVC. So those are the three that I know of. And of course, feel free to, to name any additional ones free. Is there anything else that you've seen in terms of an exploitation technique or a, an identification of the vulnerability technique? Uh. No, I mean, if, if, if you don't have access to like the jar file for the system, um, I, I don't, it's like you said, there's no silver bullet right now. Um, if you do have access to a jar file, I've seen a couple of command line utilities that people have put out. Um, there, are, there are a couple of tools in the space to basically just tell you what is in the jar um, and to at least tell you if the vulnerable uh, file is, is in there, the unpatched spring, spring file. Indeed, indeed. Now, we're coming up to the half hour mark. Uh, we already have one question and we're gonna dive into that uh, in more detail. So please feel free to send us more, more questions, everyone. Apologies for the short uh, video lapses that we have. It's a live YouTube event, these things happen. Before we dive into just a little bit what we can do to remediate and also just the pattern of remediation for you out there that are information security officers, CISOs, people in SDLC teams, etc. cetera. Um, I wanna make sure that we've covered, you know, we haven't left any, any aspect untouched with regards to, to this vulnerability. So before we look at remediation, and we talked about what this vulnerability does, um, Free, what, what do you think is special about Spring for Shell compared to like compared to other vulnerabilities or compared what, to what, other what vulnerabilities you... yeah or perhaps uh, even compared to log for shell right given that it shares a common name but i'm leaving that question open ended because yeah. i really want to gauge your view with regards to what do you think is is different or special about this vulnerability spring for shell yeah 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 well, i guess like i i have like a bot that's like pings me every time a new cve comes out um, and it has like some arbitrary severity and I, I go through, you know, maybe every couple of days and I go and look at like GitHub security alerts and mm -hmm. I keep, keep my eyes on like Twitter and, and Hacker News. So it's like, I'm, I'm kind of like always looking and trying to see what it, what is interesting. Um, and I've spent a lot of time, you know, chasing down dead ends. Just there's something like, isn't interesting and you never hear about it because it doesn't matter. Uh, so, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I would say for this vulnerability, like, like I was saying earlier, there has a prerequisite of if there's an impact here, it's really bad. Um, it affects yeah. a lot of things. Uh, RCE in any kind of program is, that's a hacker's dream. That's what they really wanna have. Uh, it's the easiest way to move forward, to pivot in a network, to do whatever, when you actually have a shell on something. But yeah, what, what else about it is it, I think part of what made me really want to blog about it was just how confusing the situation was um, and just trying to clear up that, that kind of like almost like misinformation that existed. Uh, the people, it's, it's really easy. And this happened with, with blog for J as well, um, which is why it is called blog for shell now. And why this one is called spring for shell now is because, you know, a CVE didn't get shipped out quickly. Um, the developers of mm. the software, were aware of this, but because they were filing for the CVE and trying to get a fix out, they actually ended up denying that there was even a security vulnerability while they already knew. It's kind of like, you know, not everyone in the Spring organization knew that there was a vulnerability and then the POC was already out there. Really? Um, so, I yeah, so they ended that. up denying that there was a vulnerability. Like one of the developers posted like, nope, nope, there's nothing here, like, like move on. Um, and I think that's that was that was part of what was so confusing about this. Uh, for for a lot of people, um, you know, with with Blog4j, during that time, like the Minecraft community actually, <laughs> the first communities to really start bringing this to the attention of like security researchers, uh, 
because there, you know, there had been some like posts, but nothing really big about it. And nobody had taken the time to like translate things from Chinese into English so that people could start writing about it. Um, and it was only once, you know, literally like skiddies on Minecraft started griefing each other that people realized, oh, okay, this is just like a really easy vulnerability. We can actually game. take over a server with this vulnerability, right? We can change our Minecraft or whatever ratings we, we want on this server. Yeah, it's remote code execution, as you said. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's funny when it's used to just like get, get points in a video game and like, you know, steal someone's inventory or just make somebody have a bad day. But yeah, <laughs> and you weaponize it for like a Fortune 500 company. It's a totally different scenario. Let, let me ask you this question. In, in the same context, so do you think remote code execution vulnerabilities are getting um, easier or harder to exploit? I mean, over the years, I would say they've gotten harder for sure. Uh, I mean, it, yeah, I would, I would say that they've gotten harder. I would say that security has tended to improve. Like, I, I just think of like the old like Flash days or the old Java days. Like you literally get someone to open up an applet and boom, you're in on their computer. Um, a, a lot of things have gotten better. The complexity of software has gotten higher though. Um, the amount of software out there has gotten higher. And I think that's sort of like a counteracting force. It's like average security of average apps is better, but there are more of them, so... Indeed. And look, if you told me 10 years ago, there's going to be a remote code execution vulnerability on log for shell having used log for shell professionally as well, I'll be saying, what are you talking about? Like, no, pff, it's behind the JVM. There's no <laughs> way you're going to get the class loader to do anything. And, and, and here we are. Right. And in fact, um, I, I'd also add that to your point, I think log for shell has just opened the floodgates. There are a lot of people that try to um, look for that same pattern within other places of the lock for shell uh, library and then of course it dawned on the community either black hat or white hat uh, either for fame or fortune whatever it might be um, the there are other java libraries out there as well right <laughs> hence my comment about struts or any of the other um, libraries that are out there i think that this one seems to be also um, this vulnerability, the specific Spring for Shell vulnerability, is also interesting because you have a feature being introduced by Oracle in the JVM, right, which actually gives you a ton of capability being able to get module on a class, right? That, that's massive. I wish we had that in earlier versions of, of the JVM. <laughs> but then actually what that does is it bypasses the protection that the Spring community has put in the core and allows for the controlling of properties in the class loader. So the complexity is just increasing tenfold here because you need to know what a class loader is. You need to understand properties around that, good properties, bad properties, properties which can't be controlled by hackers. And then you have Spring, specialized Java library, a lot of web apps running on, on Spring. And then on top of that, you have also the JVM update. So completely agree with you, Free, in that the complexity is increasing. And in order for us to describe this vulnerability, Spring for Shell, right? It took us a good 10 minutes going through uh, the steps there. Yeah, and we haven't even talked about like, you know, the fact that currently it's only for Tomcat and it uses JSP, which has to be enabled. But I think when you're loading a war file, like it, there's, it's it's super yeah, complicated. Absolutely. But, and then you have also like what well, what happens on OpenJDK and what happens because okay we have JVM that Oracle produces, but we also have OpenJDKs and JVMs. We have, I mean, there's just you can tweak each of those parameters and ask the same question: Does uh, Spring for Shell? exist as an exploitable remote code execution vulnerability, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we don't know. We don't know the answers at this point. It's it's just, it's simply too recent. Um, I can say what scenarios are probably not exploitable, but I couldn't necessarily tell you for sure right now. Um, 
it's it's in many ways it's a matter of time until somebody figures out a bypass for a lot of a lot of uh, cases. Like. In, indeed, and I think one of the things, you know, credit to the Spring community as well. I mean, communication aside, they did turn around two library updates on uh, 5.3.18 and 5.2.20, which address this specific issue, right? So that's really important because we don't have what we had for Lock for, for Shell and Lock for J, uh, where it was like, okay, but which version do I patch to, right? Do I um, release candidate? Do I wait for 16 or 17 you know um so so that's that's important and we need to give credit where credit is due okay so we've covered the vulnerability we we've covered also the other two vulnerabilities one involving remote code execution one not rem, uh, involving remote code execution that we know of yet we've gone through and described in great detail the conditions required for this vulnerability to be exploitable. We've also gone through and shown um, through our discussion ways that uh, you can potentially discover if this vulnerability exists on a web server. So that's very important. And now we're gonna, for the last part of this uh, YouTube live event, before we go to Q&A, we are going to focus on on remediation. Now, my question to you, Free, is around remediation other than updating the library. Have you seen any remediation out there other than updating Spring Core, which is worthy of note here? Yeah, um, so there are some manual steps you can take to basically, if you're basically adding a blacklist to the, uh, to the I forget the exact keyword. It was the first thing that we posted about uh, yesterday. I think it was yesterday. God, my days are blurring. Um, so no, I think it was two days ago. But you can add some Java code to the data binder to tell it to deny specific patterns in the the strings. So you can say, hey, if this is using the class loader or has the word class in it, like don't let it through. Mm -hmm. um, and that does that does seem to block the exploit uh, from from talking to everyone. It was complicated at first when we first published because we couldn't test that it was actually fixing the exploit because we didn't have a POC. <laughs> so it's kind of <laughs> just going off of rumors. Yeah, so so that was interesting because I think you're referencing um, a post um, by Praetorian that discussed the recommended ap approach of patching data binder so that there is a blacklist so that you can't actually inject patterns uh, into the, the fields which are available to be, um, in essence, manipulated. Is that what you're referencing? Uh, yes, yes, yes. I think even Cyber Kendra posted about it. So that yes. was in initial as well. And I think what we'll yeah. do at the end of this YouTube live event is, as we do always, right, is just quote the relevant links below uh, for, for our audience so that they don't have to go and start Googling on this. Uh, they can just get all the information that we reference in this YouTube live event through the links provided. So we'll make sure we update that after the event. So that's that's interesting. I found that really difficult to follow. And, you know, I, I've got a little bit of a Java background, even though retired from, from that space. The the idea like it wasn't a type of thing that I could give to a a team dealing with the incident and they could go off and kind of you know make it so it felt that this was more of a a developer team that's ready to de deploy uh, they understand this vulnerability in depth and then also they they're able to you know in essence, release code to production at very short time. Did you get that same feeling with this data binder approach, Free? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't even know when I first looked at the code how to take the code and and put it into a Spring app. Like, I, I am just not, I'm not a Spring developer. I don't know how to, I don't know how to make it, make it go for lack of a word. Like I had to like, go look at some docs and start and start figuring out. Um, we've made it a little bit easier in the blog post that we posted, but you know, with like log4shell pretty quickly, people came out with, you know, Java agents or environment variables that you could set when you redeploy an app to, to disable this functionality. 
um, that doesn't seem to exist for this vulnerability yet. There's no there's no way to just modify your startup command and have it work. You've got to go into the code. You've got to tweak it. Correct. And also, you can't just go into the um, the sprinkle jar and delete the relevant, you know, because <laughs> yeah. it would just maybe, break. Maybe now you could, there's a patch, maybe now you could go in and replace a dot class file. Like, I'll, I'll maybe I, go look into this after that call. I'm, I'm really against going in and just customize. Like, <laughs> if you're going to customize a, a jar file that you're using, yes, all for it. You know, download it. <laughs> Build it yourself. Um, download the the source. Build it yourself, and then off off you can put whatever error condition you want in there. Make sure it reports back and what's happening. All that lovely stuff. But to open up a, a jar file, which is essentially a zip file, right, and just go delete this class. It's just I don't know. It's... To be fair, though, there's gonna be a lot of vendor software out there that's not gonna be patched for you know potentially ever if it's a defunct vendor. Um, there are businesses that rely on this. So having a workaround, having a way to just, you know, without access to source code, without access to recompiling, being able to patch this, like there is value in that. Even if I agree with you, <laughs> it's not the first thing I would choose. It just, it, it's a little bit brute force, isn't it? I mean, especially given <laughs> that you have, it's a core library and you have the ability to, um, you know, to just update. Having said that, just updating, as we know, spring dependencies, can take days to sort, right? I remember in the just going through the like the Eclipse environment would crash in essence because it would run out of memory trying to re-index all the relevant dependencies every time wow. I would just try to update a, a library. And it wasn't due to the lack of memory on that on that machine. Okay, so that's that's remediation, ah, potential remediation that our audience can can take here. Anything else that you've seen that's interesting from a remediation perspective? And I'm, I'm also scratching my head and going, oh, mm, I haven't seen anything that's worth worthy of note. Yeah, I can't think of everything. I think we covered, we covered, you know, what's known and, and what's theoretical, at least right now. Like, I mean, in theory, if you could deploy your app on Java 1.8, that is a path you can choose too. That's true. You could actually, oh dear me, you could actually downgrade <laughs> your JVM. And the reason that we're laughing, everyone, is because actually, if you think about um, <laughs> upgrading your JVM, right, that's a tedious process enough. Uh, now we're talking about downgrading uh, your specific Java virtual, uh, virtual machine or, or your JRE. Um, we're coming up to the 45 minute mark. I'm just checking on questions. We have a few questions that have come in. So let me uh, read out the first question. To, 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 here we are. So this question has come in through uh, the chat on YouTube and it reads, how are we able to detect that a website uses the Spring, fr Spring Framework with the specific vulnerable version? Uh, I think we touched on this a little bit in the call, but uh, there, there's one uh, query parameter you can add that if the app is vulnerable, return a 400 status code. Uh, it can give more false positives, though, because you know a lot of apps can return a 400. Maybe your proxy, your Nginx, whatever you have in front of it is configured to, you know, maybe it, I think it might even use a Unicode character, so it might just say, hey, bad request, 400 status code. So it's not bulletproof. Uh, the other one that Yannis was talking about was is, is a newer one. I This has changed since literally last night when I went to bed because I was in a conversation about this. But basically, the idea is you run one, one request to the server. It taints a global object. You run a second request. You see if the global object has been tainted. Um, that is going to be difficult if you have a load balancer, for example, <laughs> because you know maybe you have 100, 100 servers. You make a request to taint it. You go to read, you might get two different servers. Um, yeah. So unless you're able to talk to an exact instance, that's going to be a more difficult one to achieve. In, indeed, indeed, those are the two main ones. And and we'll recap on those. But let me ask you this question, Free: Have you actually seen any um, uh, vulnerability updates with regards to web application firewalls or similar blocking such requests? Yeah, I think CloudFront, Cloudflare distributed something. Uh, yesterday on their social media. Uh, I don't remember exactly what 
they said, but yeah, I'm sure all the laugh vendors are having this covered. Yeah. Okay, so just to summarize here on, on this question, and again, it's a, it's a complex answer. Uh, basically, there's three, three techniques here in terms of discovering that a website uses a Spring Framework that is vulnerable. Um, that, well, four if you count that you're dealing with a dev environment, right? That's over verbose about its property, so we, we're not going to count that one. So the, the first one is the specific request request response that free talked about that involves getting a 400 back that has as a prerequisite that you have and you can read about exactly what that request is in the relevant blog post we'll include it in the links that has as a prerequisite that you're talking to the web server or the proxy or the path to the server is not going through a path that basically is altering errors or other types of responses so that's number one. Second involves um, requests to change one of the parameters um, which are properties in the class loader that normally you don't have a control and then observation to that web server again same problem that you have there in terms of being able to discover that uh, vulnerability in that there could be you know if it's a load balancer distributing as free said to each of the web servers uh, behind that proxy or load balancer or setup, then you risk basically not knowing which machine you're talking to. I can see there a potential brute force attack to just send many requests to make sure that you hit all the servers and we'll name that, you know, spring for shell brute force or something, <laughs> TM. Um, so that's the second method. And then, oh, it's gone. What was the third one? Third. I mean, the third is if you have access to the jar file, you can always you can always scan it, um, check for the class file inside of it. True, true. You could do that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You could do that. And there's a fourth one which we we're not really counting, which involves the dev environment and being able to actually query directly what type of uh, Spring in, uh, environment is is being used because those properties are, are listed. Not very common in production environments involving Spring Core. You don't really don't get that information easily off a, off a web server in terms of enumerating what version of Spring Core is, is running on it. Okay, so we have one more question. This has come in via email. Uh, could you do a recording to show the exploit from beginning to end uh, on the setup that you have? And could you possibly add a um, web proxy and Jinx web proxy, uh, reverse proxy in front of it? Um, okay, we're not going to do it as part of this YouTube live event. I don't know. Food for thought there, free. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I'll sit. I'll sit with um, the engineer on my team, Chris. He's he's awesome. He's actually the guy that was rewriting the PSC and uh, put a bunch of the more technical content into the the post. But yeah, I think he would be he'd be stoked to to go do that. He teaches classes to high schoolers and runs CTFs and stuff. So I think he's he'd be pretty good at that. All right. So we'll take that action uh, from this event, and we'll also. See it as an apology for the the video just lapsing every every one of the videos lapsing every <laughs> every now and then. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. Those were the two questions that came through. So with that, um, closing remarks from you, Free. Um, well, first of all, I apologize for my video being being awful. I think it has to do with probably the power of my webcam. But um, yeah, closing thoughts. Otherwise. Uh, this this really taught me the value of clear communication, <laughs> especially in chaos. Um, like it definitely makes me understand like you know why the military has such regimented hierarchies for for things because it, it's very difficult when you have a ton of people clambering for answers, just trying to help, but actually causing more chaos because they're putting the wrong information out there and nobody. It's because you don't have enough information, you can't verify what information is real or not. So you end up with this crazy amplification of just noise. And, and I think free, we've just added to that crazy communication because anybody who's going to watch this 
afterwards is going to get the video just flickering. Oh yeah, yeah. every couple well, of minutes. Was, but I guess I would say anyone watching this, you know, more than twenty four hours from now, like please, please go, you know, go find some up to date resources because everything we said in this call could have been become completely invalid. Yeah, that's very true. It's a, it's a live uh, event that is get, taking this snapshot in time. And what we'll do is through the links that we're going to provide you, please go and follow up on those links. That's the most important thing, uh, because that's how you're going to have the latest up to date uh, information. Yeah, absolutely. Like knowing knowing what information sources are you know good to follow are is important. Like you know the official Spring Developer page has really good information about this. I actually would say that they've done a really good job. Um, I think they've done a better job than the Apache did with the whole lark for j thing, um, at least with the initial post that they've put up. They've put up a lot of details. They've helped answer the questions. And they've made it really clear like what the problem is and how to, how to deal with it. And so kudos, kudos to the whole Spring team for <laughs> their and work on this. very short time as well, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually, actually, much faster too, and than, than Apache with the Log4j because they actually got wind of that exploit a couple of weeks before it came out as a, a big thing. Um, so they they had time to develop and test the exploit. Uh, in the in this case with the Spring uh, team, they had less than twenty four hours, I think, before people had a POC in hand and were starting to to weaponize this. So I think it was you know under thirty six hours before they had posted a public fix with an explanation. Yeah, indeed, indeed. On the thirty six hours, that's that's record time, right? Yeah, it's incredible. I I would say just I hope we don't have a a struts for shell next uh, or another specific issue, right? That involves the plethora of libraries, the many libraries that Java has out there. Uh, the key ingredients are some sort of upgrade in the JVM a known vulnerability that in the past wasn't really a big deal and sometimes either reflection deserialization that those are the ingredients that seem to brew remote code execution when it comes to the the uh, java world uh, out there so hopefully this is going to be the end of those types of, of vulnerabilities otherwise i can just see that we're just going to discover a pattern whereby specific library calls throughout different frameworks are going to become basically your next full shell remote code execution vulnerability. I really hope that doesn't happen because then we're going to have so many vulnerabilities on our hands to deal with as information security professionals. Yeah, yeah, it's tricky. I mean, the whole idea of plugins for software is, I mean, it's important, it's important, especially for enterprises um, that have these huge code bases that don't want to have hour-long builds to be able to build things in modules and import them uh, dynamically. But yeah, like anytime you expose that functionality, it's really important to, to think about the security of it and, and manage those changes effectively. And I think in, in this case, it added a whole new dimension of complexity that changed the assumptions that had been made previously by projects like Spring from patching vulnerabilities like this. Like, you know, it kind of created this false sense of security of like, okay, like this, we already have mitigations in place. We already have, you know, an understanding of the plugin system, but now with this new API, and now if somebody doesn't realize, like the Spring developers don't realize that this is a different syntax, different way of dealing with it. Um, you've now introduced that, that additional complexity that an attacker can take advantage of. It, it's really... it, indeed. It, it, and not only that, but the preconditions to the complexity. So, for example, if you take your traditional, uh, what came out of the, the Biden executive order that software needs to have a, an SBOM, a software bill of materials, right? The, the report on the SBOM that's using Spring Core 5317 will say this is exploitable under a Java VM version 9, right? By then, probably Java 10 might have got this patched, or there might be some other condition as well. So already we're seeing how this complexity is going to affect the concept of knowing what's inside your software. Because if I'm a CISO in an organization, how do I action something coming out of that SBOM file when it involves the specific 
spring for shell vulnerability, right? What, what's what's the action that I need to do? Well, I, I need to ask if I'm running JVM9, and I need to ask if whether or not this is on the internet. Okay. Right, and if you're if you're using Tomcat in this case. And if you, um, thank you, yes, indeed, Tomcat, and then also, what do we have in front of that spring? Like you know, the the whole do we have a set of load balancers? So already right. with an S bomb file, we're getting information that requires so much follow up. And I think whoever's going to be able to distill that information to meaningful action is going to be very successful in this space going forward because of what you said, Free, that vulnerabilities are basically increasing in complexity. Yeah, and the infrastructure is increasing in complexity. You know, everyone is like running things in the cloud, everything's they, and not even just the cloud. It's like you have these hybrid environments now. Um, people don't necessarily have to worry about network controls as much. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's it is a lot of complexity. And like like you're saying, it's knowing where your software is running, what's in your software, but also knowing like how your software is deployed, all of the services in the chain from like, you know, exposed exposure to the internet all the way through to like where your service is. Um, you know, with microservices, this is this is a massive problem. Um, when yes. I was working at Uber was figuring out like, you know, one thing comes in to, to the edge server and now it propagates to this massive graph of <laughs> microservices. Yes. Figuring out, you know, authorization controls, figuring out like who can, can is calling it what, it was just such a nightmare. Um, and there are good solutions in that space with like things like surface meshes. Um, and, and those, those can help, you know, you can set up a WAF in front of that. You can set up, uh, you can restrict access to certain endpoints, but it's, it's a fundamentally hard problem. And, you know, I think, I think it's like listed as like the security, cybersecurity is like the fourth largest, like economic loss now, like, uh, worldwide. It's, uh, I think wet, like climate change is number one, but like number four is cybersecurity now. And, and. It's cybersecurity is very much a, a black box still. So if I think about effectively what we're describing, you need some sort of operational graph of the S bomb in terms of how you're using it to accompany yeah. what comes with the software, and that then will tell you as to whether or not you know you have a cybersecurity issue. Um, if you're being impacted by this vulnerability, what is the the impact that microservices scenario that you gave has always been you know even though it's really good to architect and build and modular and so on it it's creates such a headache in terms of discovering the impact um third or second or even fourth degree impact into the organization based on the fact that you've got something that's coming in which is now being exploited in some shape or form right yeah yeah absolutely absolutely because you know in theory if you have a microservices environment you can have a WAF that's configured to restrict this rule but something in the chain somewhere modifies it and now the payload is able to right, right. exploit exploit spring in the back end yeah, um yeah you know, that was that was one of, one of the big pain points with log for shell was uh you know somebody could could throw this into their analytic cookie and that gets logged by some third-party vendor and then some back-end job hoovers the data up from the analytics provider, shoves it in Hadoop or some data lake somewhere, and now that's getting run on a back-end job uh, that's running in Java. And so the actual, there's there's no real-time interface from a browser to this to the service that's exploring right. this. It's yeah. in some log file living somewhere. And I can't see the equivalent of, you know, the iPhone name being changed to some sort of spring uh, class <laughs> property parameter yet. Uh, that is why this is not as bad. That is why this is absolutely not as bad. But, you know, it's an SSRF could exploit this, um, yeah. like a server server request forgery. So somebody who you, you go to, you paste in a link on a website to say, upload your, your photo from another website. Like if you go to Imgur, you can paste in a link to something you copy from Google. And go on the back end, Imgur will pull that image in uh, by hitting Google's search downloading the image, pulling it into Imager's server. But if that's misconfigured, that can send a request to another service. Yeah, scenarios are endless. endless. Very good. So 
Free, I just want to thank you for, for your time today. I think you did a sterling job given that there was a little bit of a, an AV hiccup, right? Yeah, keeping your chain of thought while sorting out whatever was going on <laughs> with the camera. And it wasn't as bad as, as we've described. We just needed to, to acknowledge it and, and move on. For our audience, thank you for the participations, the, the questions that we had. And hopefully you've learned a little bit more about Spring for Shell, what's exploitable, what's remote code execution, what isn't. And we've walked you through some of the scenarios and more importantly, what mitigations we're actively seeing on this issue. Until next time, thank you 